Good afternoon, everybody. Hi there. Um, before we get started today, I just wanted to quickly introduce over in the corner there, Annabelle Silva, who's here from All American Assisted Living in Rentham, if you know right near the Target there. That's where I said. Anyway, Annabelle, um, very kindly, they sponsored today's refreshments, and what a spread. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. And um, we're happy to choose, agree to do this once a month, so we're thrilled. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our guest today. We have very newly retired within the last month or so, yes, yes, uh, Court Justice Paul Wilson, who's going to talk about, um, I, I think probably wherever the direction goes, but the judicial system here in United States, Massachusetts. All right. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got the podium because I've got some notes here and didn't want to lose track of them. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson. As Debbie said, I am a very recently retired Superior Court judge here in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts has a mandatory retirement age for judges. I wasn't ready to go, but they threw me out the window when I hit that age. Uh, and so here I am. Uh, thank you for the excuse to put on a tie, which I haven't done for a while. <laughs> My retirement was about six weeks ago, actually. Uh, but the first two weeks doesn't count, because I was in Australia, New Zealand with my Aww. wife Aww. and my son and my daughter-in-law. And here was the deal. I think my son forgot he was talking to a lawyer when he said this to me a year ago. Dad, after you retire and before we start giving you grandkids, let's go on a nice trip together, the four of us. <laughs> and I said, yes. So now we've gone on the trip, and I think the other side of the deal is, you know, where's, yeah, where's those grandkids? I'm not going to sue them yet. I'm not going to sue them yet. All right, let me tell you a little bit about, about my topic theoretically today is this, uh, the rule of law, how the rule of law and not the rule of man governs in this country, and thank goodness it does, and the importance of the court system, an independent and strong judiciary in enforcing the rule of law. Uh, but, uh, as Debbie said, we're, I'm happy to talk about lots of other stuff as well, and I've got remarks I've outlined here, but please feel free to interrupt with questions. I don't want to make a speech. I'd rather have a conversation. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about the Massachusetts court system. There are generically two kinds of courts, trial courts, where lawsuits or criminal prosecutions start. Somebody sues somebody, they go to the local trial court. Uh, the government prosecutes somebody for a crime, they go to the local trial court. And there are two levels in Massachusetts. The Superior Court, obviously, is the higher of the two levels. Uh, and so if a crime ended up in front of me, it was probably a felony. Uh, and if a lawsuit ended up in front of me, it was probably about at least $50,000 uh, or involved some request for a court order to order somebody to do something or not do something. That's what the Superior Court does. Uh, and the, in less momentous cases, the district court uh, below uh, our court does that as well. The other kind of generic court is the, uh, an appellate court. We have two of them in Massachusetts, one called the Appeals Court, and the other called the Supreme Judicial Court, which is our highest court. Uh, and anyone who's dissatisfied with how things come out in the, uh, in the trial court can then go to uh, one of the appellate courts and say, the judge got it wrong, and here's the mistake he made, and please fix it by overturning the verdict or whatever. So those are the two kinds of courts we have. Uh, as of yesterday, there is about to be an opening on the state Supreme Court. Justice Seifer has, uh, has announced her retirement early at the age of 64, because uh, she's going to go teach at Boston College Law School, I think. Uh, so if anyone, you've, any of you are interested, there is that opening there. Yeah, well, that's true. If you're over 70, you can't serve. Sorry. Um, so, um, uh, so that's the court system. And I was a judge for almost 11 years in the Superior Court. Um, before that, I was a lawyer for 30 years in the same law firm. I'd say I'd have the same, I had the same job for 30 years, but it, the job changed dramatically, of course, as the firm got bigger and I got more senior. Uh, and by the end of my career as a lawyer, I was doing uh, mostly litigated lawsuits involving real estate in some fashion or other, land use in particular. I had a subspecialty in uh, affordable housing land use. Uh, and, um, and I did a little bit of environmental law because it's on the fringes of real estate law, right? And so I was delighted to read out there that we're in a former Superfund site here, a contaminated site from 100 years of, of industry here that was cleaned up by the EPA and Walpole and hopefully the people who contributed to the contamination. I did a little bit of that kind of work too. Um, so um, that's me, that's the court system. 
Uh, and it, well, I should say one of the most important things that judges do is not just deciding the cases, but coming out and talking to the citizens of Massachusetts, who, if they're lucky, never will be in a courtroom <laughs> themselves, uh, except maybe for jury duty, which I think is a real cool thing to do. Uh, I know not everyone agrees with that, at, at least when they're called for jury duty. Yeah. At, at the end of the trial, it's remarkable to me, uh, I would always go talk to my jurors after they had delivered their verdict, just to spend five minutes with them to answer their questions, to thank them personally for what they did. And so often, one of them would say, oh, geez, I didn't want to be here. You know, I, I, I saw the video about jury service at the beginning of the day yesterday, and I was rolling my eyes. But now that I've done it, the juror will say, this was really interesting. And sometimes, I like this even more, one of those jurors will say, now that I've done it, now that we've done it, now that the 12 of us have sat around this table and made this decision, now I really understand how important it is that the randomly selected citizens of the locality decide these things and not a judge and not, God forbid, like in many countries, some government, faceless government bureaucrat decides who's going to jail and who's not or who should win the lawsuit and who shouldn't. So uh, you, you, if, once you're 70, you no longer have to serve on a jury. But you can if you want, if you get the notice. And last year, while he was still on the U.S. Supreme Court, Stephen Breyer showed up for jury duty in Woburn in Middlesex Pier Court because I guess he's still a legal resident of Cambridge. He was a professor at Harvard before he became a judge. And he got his jury notice, and so he showed up in my, one of my colleagues' courtrooms uh, to be uh, selected for a jury. Uh, they didn't get to him, and my colleague did not regret that, he said. But, <laughs> but anyway, so you can show up even if you're over 70, and I recommend it. All right, so... Um, as I said, please ask questions as I go along. I'll leave some time at the end for questions, not just about the rule of law, but about anything else you want to know about the judiciary, how the courts work, anything like that. Um, but the rule of law, that's, what we, that's how we do things in this country, and we are blessed that we do. Uh, it's the opposite of the rule of man. And in 1770, consider Massachusetts in 1770, uh, it was under the rule of a man whose name was George III. He was 3,000 miles away across an ocean, but he was not subject to any laws. He could say, and he did say, you people in Massachusetts, I'm going to send you an army to defend you because of the French and Indian War, which is just over, and I'm going to make you take those soldiers into your homes and you'll feed them and give them a bed. He could do that all by himself, and he did. Uh, and he could, he and his parliament could impose taxes without asking, without representation, uh, of course, by any, any word from the people who were affected by it. And that's the rule of man, uh, the rule of a man in, in particular. Uh, there was one of those oppressed colonials in Massachusetts whose name was John Adams, and he famously said in the early 1770s, what we need is a rule of, uh, we need to be a government of laws and not of men. Uh, and that was, that's the idea behind the rule of law. He put those words, that concept, into the Massachusetts Constitution when he drafted it uh, in the, in the 1770s. Uh, 1780, I think it was adopted. It's the oldest written constitution in the world, and that idea of his, a government, a, a rule of law and not of a man or of men, then made its way into the U.S. Constitution seven years later and lots of other state constitutions. But it started here in Massachusetts because John Adams like the idea of a, the rule of law, and he was certainly right to do it. Um, so, uh, where does the law come from? Three minutes on civics class, a few years ago for most of us, right? Three branches of this government, but before we even get there, where do they come from? They come from the most basic law we have, the United States Constitution, which said, uh, which really lays out how the government is structured, how it's gonna work, uh, what it's gonna look like. So, what it's gonna look like is three branches a legislative branch to pass laws, an executive branch to enforce laws, uh, and a judicial branch to do what judges do, decide controversies, and in the course of that, make law a little bit sometimes. Um, and so the other thing the Constitution does, and I'll get to this a little bit more later, is to uh, establish the relationship between the government and its citizens. So there, particularly the Bill of Rights is important. The first 10 amendments uh, uh, granting rights, making explicit what John Adams thought was implicit anyway, uh, that the government can only, uh, ha has to follow the rule of law, its, its citizens have rights against the government, as they certainly didn't in England back then. Uh, and so we're going to say it out loud and attach it to the Constitution in the first uh, ten amendments. Uh, 
Uh, so um, now the, the three branches are all involved in making law in different ways. Uh, the, the Constitution says we sets out really basic, basic core concepts, um, but it leaves it to the legislature to get more specific. Uh, the Constitution doesn't say how the government's going to fund itself, for instance. Uh, it says that it, can, it has certain powers of taxation, but that's about all it says. Uh, and and th certain things it can't do. It can't tax commerce between the states, because that would be us being nasty to Connecticut or Rhode Island being nasty to us. So, we can't, so that's about all it says about taxation. So we need statutes. We need the Congress to say, we're going to fund the government with an income tax, for instance. And it lays out what the income tax is going to be in general terms. But that's not very specific either. So the next level of specificity comes from the government agency, an administrative agency in the executive branch, which says, OK, Congress has said we should collect taxes so we can pay for the roads and the, and the battleships. How do we do that? Well, here's a bunch of very specific regulations. It's called the Internal Revenue Code. It's about this thick now. Uh, and so, that, so it gets more and more specific as we go from general concepts in the Constitution to more specific concepts in a statute to really fine, fine regulation uh, in, in, uh, issued by an administrative agency. So that, it's obvious, therefore, that the Congress and the state legislature are making laws. It's obvious that the administrative agencies, like the Internal Revenue Service, the EPA, uh, you name it, uh, are, are making laws when they issue regulations. The judges in the judicial branch, however, don't so obviously make laws. The judicial branch is here to solve disputes, to decide individual cases. Uh, so if somebody sues somebody else, that plaintiff comes to my courtroom, uh, is not looking to asking me to make some law. It's just asking me to say, or me and a jury perhaps to say, uh, I had the green light, she had the red light, she ran into me, make her give me money. To, to repair my car and to fix my leg or whatever. Uh, the judge is being asked to decide a specific case, and no more than that. So there's not really an occasion to make law, like passing a statute like the Internal Revenue uh, Law or enacting regulations like the code, the Internal Revenue Code. But judges, in deciding those disputes, sometimes end up making law because they have to interpret a statute, interpret the Constitution, interpret a regulation. And in doing that, they lay down a rule that is going to be followed by others. Um, the um, classic case, a classic case here, is Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, the cop who arrested Mr. Miranda in 1960, whatever, just died. His obituary was in the Globe, which I only know because I'm now retired and can actually read the Boston Globe now. Um, and that made me think of the Miranda case. Miranda was a guy who was arrested by this police officer in, in Arizona in 1960-something. And while he was in the station house in police custody, he confessed to whatever crime he was charged with. Uh, now, the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution says, you know if you've watched police shows, that before a police officer questions somebody in custody, he's got to tell that person, you don't have to speak here. You've got a right to remain silent. You, you, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Well, this officer didn't do that because, I guess... No one did that, or few people did that back then. And so uh, Mr. Miranda goes to trial in front of a judge and a jury. He gets convicted because, I guess in part, the, the jury was told about the confession, played, you know, maybe they played a tape of it, I don't know. Uh, and his lawyer said, this is not right. The Constitution's been violated here. He had a right to be told he could remain silent. That's what that Fifth Amendment right means. Uh, and um, so Miranda's lawyer takes it up to the appeals court. On the appeals court, I don't know what the appeals court did, but whatever the result is, somebody took it up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court thinks about what that Fifth Amendment right means, and if it's really a right, if, uh, if the police can question you for hours and not tell you about your right not to talk to them, uh, and it decides the Fifth Amendment really means that if you're in custody anyway, uh, you can't, uh, and, and you confess, that confession cannot be used against you unless you were told beforehand you had a right not to talk to the officers. So, so what happened? So, what's the Supreme Court doing? It's saying, Mr. Miranda, you're right. You and your lawyer are right. We're tossing out that guilty verdict because it was improperly obtained, unconstitutionally obtained. What happened to Mr. Miranda, of course, was he was then retried. 
uh, be, uh, because just because you threw out one confession doesn't mean that it can't, they can't try him again. And they try him before a different jury without mentioning the confession, and he gets convicted anyway. So it didn't ultimately do him much good. But the rest of us now have had the U.S. Supreme Court saying, laying out what's now law. The law says you have to tell somebody in custody about that right not to talk. So that's how judges make law. They're, they don't set out to do it. And it's, by the way, mostly an appellate judge function, not a trial judge function like me. Um, although I just had to do that. One of my, my second last decision was about the Martha's Vineyard Commission and how the Martha's Vineyard Commission is a regional planning agency. It is um, told by the state legislature, created by the state legislature in the 1970s, uh, and given this broad charter to protect the ecological, economic, cultural values of this special place, which is Martha's Vineyard. And that's what the, that's what the legislation says. That's what the legislature said. And so a dispute arises between the commission and somebody, some developer who he's told, the commission said, you can't build those 26, $3 million houses. We're saying that's not consistent with the ecological, cultural, and economic values of this special place, which is Martha's Vineyard. And so they come to a judge, and the judge says, well, the statute's kind of vague. Uh, have courts interpreted it before? Yes, but not on this exact question. And so I have to figure out what the law means. So in that sense, I've made law when I issue that decision about how far the power of the commission goes under that broad and vague uh, charter to protect the ecological, cultural, and et cetera values of the, of the island. Now, I'm guessing that that decision is going to go up to the state Supreme Court because there's a lot of money at stake and because there was no clear law to guide me. So I'm going to find out in a year or so whether I got it right or not. And the state Supreme Court, the Supreme Judicial Court, we call it, is going to make the law, actually. But for the moment, my decision is the law. So that's how judges make law, not in setting out to do it, but that's, that's what happens here. Um, now, so um, yes, sir. In the Miranda case, we assumed that started off in the state court, and it ended up in a federal court. Yes. In your case, it started off in a state court and ended up in a, federal, in a state court. Yes. How did you, why did you go from state to federal? Well, I'll tell you, I, I didn't tell you one thing about the structure of the courts that you just raised. There are two sets of courts in America, state courts, by far the majority of the judges are state court judges, and federal courts. And federal courts handle federal matters, uh, and state courts handle state matters. Uh, the federal, there are federal crimes. Uh, we saw that in the Varsity Blues, uh, for instance, recently, the Varsity Blues prosecution in the federal courthouse in Boston. Those uh, parents buying their kids' ways into college uh, we're violating certain federal laws, federal criminal laws. And so the U.S. attorney, the chief law enforcement officer, goes to, uh, gets them indicted, and then takes it, up, uh, takes it to trial. Uh, the decisions in those cases, to the extent that there are already, a lot of people just plead it out, so they've got no appeal right at that point, uh, will then go to a federal appeals court, First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston, which covers most of New England and Puerto Rico, and I think the judges like the Puerto Rico assignment every so often. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then from there to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's how a federal case goes up the ladder. A state court case, yes, Miranda committed a st some kind of state law crime, armed robbery, I think it was, something like that. And so he was prosecuted in a state court, like probably the Arizona Superior Court. Uh, and so, and his appeal, therefore, goes to the Arizona Appellate Courts, Court of Appeal, Arizona Supreme Court. But he's got an argument that's based on a federal law, the federal constitution. And so he can say at the end of his route up the state court system, he can say, uh, if, if the, the state courts have to recognize the federal constitution, obviously, but apparently they didn't there. They didn't interpret the, the constitution in the way that he wanted it interpreted, that that confession had to be tossed out. Uh, and so he, at the, at the end of his appellate uh, climb in Arizona, he still got one more court, a federal court, the U.S. Supreme Court, that has jurisdiction over anything involving a federal constitutional right. So he goes to the U.S. Supreme Court and says, neither that police officer nor, and, nor any level of the Arizona court recognize that I had a constitutional, a federal constitutional right that was violated here. And that's how he ends up in the, uh, in the federal court. Sir, uh, pardon me, ma'am, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no. Um, the, the, 
every federal constitutional protection of the citizens, everything in the Bill of Rights, for instance, uh, applies in federal court. You can always go to a federal court after you're done with the state court to ask it to recognize a federal constitutional right, as Mr. Miranda did. Um, but there's a lot of laws that don't actually derive from the federal constitution. Um, and so uh, you know, let's think of a state law here. There's a state law that says um, you, can't, um, you can't rob a bank. Uh, and so, so your bank robbery prosecution's in state court, and then you can't get to the federal courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, unless you can figure out how in the course of putting you in jail for robbing a bank, they somehow coerced a confession out of you, for instance, is one instance, Miranda's instance. But, <laughs> you know, oddly enough, I, my first year out of law school, I was a law clerk for a federal judge in Atlanta, Georgia. And we, the federal courts don't do murder generally, unless it's, say, terrorism related. But we got to do a murder trial that year because there was a federal prison in Atlanta and somebody got murdered in a federal prison, which turns out to be a federal crime. So the state could have prosecuted that inmate for killing the other inmate. Um, but it chose not to because it knew that the, that the federal government had indicated its, its interest in the case. And so my, the judge I was working for, I'd never, she'd never done a murder case because she was a federal judge. So we had to learn a lot about this particular type of murder that does end you up in federal court. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, there are two schools of thought. Uh, uh, well, there are more than two schools of thought, but you've laid out the two basic schools of thought about constitutional interpretation. There are people on the Supreme Court today who say, I got to figure out how it would have happened, how it would have come out in 1788 when the Constitution was ratified. Uh, what would the result have been under the law that existed then? Uh, and um, another school of thought is that, wait a minute, this is a very different society uh, in, in not only philosophically, but technologically. There are things that we do every day that no one would have dreamed of in 1788. So how do you apply those words in the 1788 Constitution to today's world? You try to figure out the spirit of those words and adjust for changing conditions. Um, uh, gun control is a very good example of this. The Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the defense of society, or words to that effect, uh, the right to bear arms shall not be uh, violated. Uh, put aside whether that meant the militia could carry guns or every citizen in America could carry guns, the decision by the Supreme Court 10, 15 years ago, it means every citizen individually has that right. But the Supreme Court, when it made that decision in Heller versus Washington, D.C., What's his name versus Chicago? Those two key decisions early on in the gun control uh, uh, litigation in the Supreme Court. They were careful to say, "Well, wait a minute. We're not saying that um, that uh, that everybody can carry any kind of gun. We're saying that since people could carry guns." blunderbusses or whatever, shotguns in 1788, guns that are sort of the modern equivalent of those are, you can't regulate. The Constitution protects your right to have them. It does not protect your right, the Supreme Court itself said, to have, uh, they had some wonderful phrase, which I've applied in a couple of cases myself, about weapons that are unusually dangerous or blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I applied it once to a switchblade because the uh, a defendant came to me and said, I'm charged with illegal possession of a switchblade, uh, which is illegal under Massachusetts law, but they can't prosecute me because of the uh, Heller decision, gun, gun control decision. And I went and read the decision and found this part about specially, particularly dangerous weapons that didn't exist in 1788. Uh, and I looked at the Massachusetts statute, which says certain kinds of weapons are still illegal here. And so the question I have is, is this the kind of weapon that is the equivalent of what existed back then? 
The answer I said was no. Uh, and an appeals court had said that, the Massachusetts Appeals Court had said it twice before it got to me in, in earlier cases. So I felt I was pre on pretty strong ground. So I said, I'm not going to dismiss this case. You can be prosecuted for, because a switchblade, because of its mechanism, the legislature has decided, is particularly dangerous. And it wasn't the sort of thing you would find in 1788. We in Massachusetts have a, one of the toughest gun laws in America, as you probably know. One of the things that prohibits your owning is a magazine that can hold more than 10 bullets. California has a law like that that's fairly recent. That has been under attack, and this is the very arguments that people are taking to court. Wait a minute, nobody could have shot 10 bullets in, in 10 seconds back in 1788. That sort of device, this magazine didn't exist. Hmm? What do you need a gun like that? Well, <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the. the I'm, and I'll be curious to see how that debate comes out uh, about because this is. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's a really interesting question about whether that's the equivalent of what a citizen could have in 1788. Uh, I, the the fact that the argument, I, I think it really. I, I, I shouldn't express opinions on this because technically I'm available for recall when they. <laughs> When, when I got, when I had to retire, my chief judge came to me and said, would you think about coming back on a recall basis temporarily if we've got, if we need judges? Because we don't, because we had a new governor who hasn't appointed any yet, right? In the six months she's been the governor. And I said, oh, yeah, I would think about that. She said, well, I think we're going to have an opening in Springfield. I said, I wouldn't think about that. No, no. <laughs> but I could theoretically come back someday. So I can't express views on which of those two views of the Constitution is right, the originalist view or the... Uh, or the change with the times and adjust to modern society yeah. things. Yes? Um, all you're hearing through the country is they want to change this constitutional right and this constitutional right. I understand that you've changed in all these hundreds of years, but if you start change, if the strategy for them to change the laws, then they're going to change it any way they want to change it. Well, but if it's a constitutional right, yes, we hear that, but it doesn't happen that often. The one example is the overturning of Roe v. Wade, where U.S. Supreme Court said 50 years after having said this is a constitutional right, under the federal constitution, it said, well, maybe no, it's not. Now, uh, interestingly enough, that echoed what the Supreme Court did in Brown v. Board of Education going in the other direction, right? In 1954, the Supreme Court said, we have decided that the school children, the black school children of Topeka, Kansas, are entitled to be integrated into the white schools in Topeka, Kansas, because you know, the black schools are so inferior. Uh, and that directly reversed a decision the Supreme Court had made 50 years earlier, in the 1890s, in Plessy versus Ferguson, which said, as to railroad cars, it's perfectly fine to have a railroad car for white people and a ra railroad car for black people. So it does change in both directions, but it's a rare event that it does. Now, there's a lot of talk about it. and. But since we're governed by the rule of law, any of those state legislatures who enact things that trample existing constitutional rights have to go to a judge uh, to have the judge say, can this, is this new, this new, um, whatever DeSantis's later thing is, latest thing is, is this, is, does this, is this consistent with the U.S. Constitution or isn't it? And a judge will decide that. And judges have been striking down uh, efforts in many states to do things that uh, where the where there have been laws passed that turn out to be, when a judge looks at it, unconstitutional. And that's one of the things we mean by the rule of law. That's why we have judges. That's why we need an independent judiciary. I mean, look at what happened in December of 2020. We have an election result. We have a president, a president, the equivalent of King George III in 17-whatever in London, right? <laughs> who's saying, this election was rife with fraud, uh, and so I'm still the president. Now, if he were, well, we have got a recent, ex well, uh, let's, not, let's not go f too far away. If he were Vladimir Putin, let's say, and he said, he lost an election, he said, I'm still the president of Russia, he'd still be the president of Russia, right? But in America, because we have the rule of law and not the rule of that man or any man, he's got to go to court. And he went to court 40 or 50 times in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, uh, all these places. And, and the judges didn't say, oh, you're still the president because you're the president. And they also didn't say, we're going to toss this out because you're not the president. They said what judges say. You presented me with an individual case. You say there was fraud in the way they counted the ballots in Philadelphia. Well, come and show me the proof. <laughs> 
and then I will decide whether to overturn this election or not. And in every one of those 40 or 50 cases, the judges, federal judges, state judges, federal judges appointed by Donald Trump, federal judges appointed by Barack Obama, federal judges appointed by both of the Bushes, they all said, I'm sorry, you know, we, we're here to enforce the law. You haven't shown us that the law was broken in the way they counted the votes in Philadelphia or Detroit or wherever. Uh, and so um, you lose. And that's one of the best examples ever of why the rule of law is so important, why the independent judiciary to enforce it is so important, and why we're lucky to live in a country we live in. <laughs> now, some of my relatives live in places that are not Massachusetts, but they too benefited. Some of them live, one of my brother lives in Philadelphia. And by the way, if I had to guess who he voted for, it might have been Donald Trump. Well, at least the first time it was Donald Trump. I'm not sure about the second time. Uh, but he, too, living in Philadelphia, benefits from that judge in Philadelphia looking closely at how the votes were counted and asking for proof that there was some wrongdoing and no proof presented. <laughs> I don't know what the law is about convicted felons holding office. I doubt. There may be a, something that prevents it. I'm just not sure uh, because it's an unprecedented issue. Never one that I faced as a judge, certainly. Uh, yeah, thank God. Uh, I, I'd be surprised, frankly, though, if he is convicted before the 24 election because he's got... Uh, he's got a lot of lawyers, although they seem to change with some regularity, uh, and they've got a lot of things to talk about. Is Florida the right place? If he really took, put the documents in the boxes in Washington, D.C., why are you prosecuting in Florida? Because that's just where they ended up. Maybe it's the wrong place. So let's file a motion about that. It'll take a judge two months to decide that. And then, you know, uh, this, uh, are you wrongly forcing my attorney, he will say, to, to, to talk to you? There's an attorney-client privilege that was violated here, so toss the whole thing. Judge will take some time to decide that. I doubt it'll be over. I doubt it will be tried. He'll be tried before 2024. So it will be interesting, though, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, you know, Brown versus Board of Education is an illustration of one of the um, most important aspects of the rule of law. One thing that we say in the law, we say in the U.S. Constitution more than once, uh, is that people are entitled to equal protection under the laws. That means everybody in America, theoretically, is to be treated equal by their government. Uh, and so if you're the parent of that black kid in Topeka in 1952, uh, and you decide, I've had it with this terrible school my kid goes to. The, the white school next door is a lot nicer. I want my kid to go to that white school. Uh, that person goes and finds a lawyer and sues the gov it's the government that's doing him wrong, he said, by treating his kid differently from the kids uh, of, the, of the white folks in the next neighborhood over. Um, and so one of the beauties of the rule of law is that he can do that. He can go say his government is treating him unequally, or his kid unequally from the other kid. Uh, and uh, he doesn't have to worry, as he would in many places, where a man is in charge rather than the law about, um, about you know, getting fired for it, getting sent to Siberia for saying this, getting arrested in the Moscow airport like Brittany Griner for, for whatever she got arrested for so she could be a pawn in a, in a prisoner exchange down the road. That's what happens in countries that are not following the rule of law. Uh, and I should mention the lawyers, too. Uh, by the way, lawyers will not, in many countries, are afraid to challenge the government, afraid to take on a case like that because they know what may happen to them, and it's not pretty either. Uh, and so thank goodness that we, we live in a country where, where we mean it when we say the government should treat everybody equally. Um, and in that case, that's another example of the U.S. Supreme Court not trying to make law, really, trying to, um, uh, to resolve a particular dispute. Uh, this, this dad and mom say their kids should go to that school because the white kids get to go there, and the Supreme Court ultimately says that's what equal protection means. Yes, you can do that. So now the Supreme Court knew it was, going, it was a very important decision because the legend is that Earl Warren, who was a chief justice then, waited for, he had, I think they had re-argument at one point because he was trying to convince one or two people on the court to make it a unanimous decision because he knew how groundbreaking it would be. Uh, and he did eventually got, it was a nine to nothing vote eventually. So they knew they were making law. 
but they were only making law as to schools. After Brown versus Board of Education, if you're Wichita, Kansas, even though you're not a party of the first case, you see, oh, well, Topeka can't, can't put the black kids in a poor school, so we can't either. And you integrate the schools. <laughs> That's overly simplistic. We all know how many years that took and what Boston and other places went through to do it, but eventually it did happen. But the interesting thing about it is it doesn't say anything about any other, since the Supreme Court's deciding about schools, equal protection of kids in schools, it's not saying anything about who can go to the public swimming pool run by Topeka, Kansas. Uh, and so, so Topeka, or any city in the South, can continue to keep black people out of the public swimming pools that their taxpayers, their tax dollars pay for. Until somebody says, wait a minute, the theory behind Brown versus Board of Education is that separate facilities are inherently unequal. And you're not even getting a facility as black people uh, for the, to go swimming in. There's only one pool in this town, and it's, it's whites only. So let's go file the lawsuit and get the federal courts, or maybe the state courts, to say, no, equal protection means everybody gets to swim in the same pool, too. And we had to do, and there's a lot of that litigation that followed in the 50s and 60s about different, different public facilities and when they had to be integrated. So that's one really important aspect of the rule of law. Equal protection. Everybody gets treated the same, and there's a court to go to if you're not treated the same. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the consequences uh, for your life, your job, your whatever, if you're challenging the government that way, <laughs> unlike many countries. Um, I should say, there's a danger of backsliding. I don't know if we should be worried about that in this country. But when I was a new judge, relatively new judge, um, I went on a judicial exchange program, legal judicial exchange program to Turkey uh, to, with some other judges and some lawyers to, to meet Turkish judges and lawyers and legislators and journalists. Turkey was then a functioning democracy. Uh, and it had a rule of law, at least on paper. And the judges we talked to in Turkey would tell us that there was sometimes they were a little bit nervous about some of the decisions they were being asked to make because they went against Mr. What's his name? Erdogan's uh, desires, but they felt like judges in a system that was uh, that was run by, under the rule of law. We came back, and a year or two later, Erdogan decided, ah, enough of this. He made up some excuse about this cleric in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, tried to overthrow him, having having bought all the judges and the journalists, and he started putting judges and journalists in jail, legislators in jail. Uh, if, if from what had been a functioning rule of law based country two years earlier when I was there. Uh, and a little sidelight, to her credit, one of the women who'd been on that trip to Turkey with us was a law student at the time at Boston College Law School. She was the intern of the judge who'd organized it. And she was a native of Turkey. Uh, and so she, as soon as Erdogan decided he was going to start putting judges in jail, uh, she rallied the law firm where she worked, my old law firm, if by coincidence, to do lots of free work trying to get those people out of jail in Turkey to the extent you could do that from here. They also, the firm also did some great work in helping the judges who were lucky enough to be out of the country, say, at a conference when all of a sudden Erdogan was trying to put them in jail, and journalists as well. Uh, and, um, uh, and they did a lot of good for people to help them to s adjust their immigration status. <laughs> I'm a judge from Turkey. I'm out here at a conference, and all of a sudden I've got to be, I, I need to be able to stay. Can you please issue me a visa? I mean, that's, so the, my, my old law firm did a lot of that work and got a lot of those people safe in America or other countries that weren't Turkey. Uh, and I had the privilege of going to the ceremony a year later where my old law firm gave that third-year lawyer, whatever she was by then, its national award for her pro bono services. Um, and I got to go there and cheer uh, because I could go there because I was never going to hear a case from that law firm, so it was okay for me to go there because it was my old law firm, right? <laughs> I couldn't be fair. Uh, so I got to go honor her with, with my old partners and all her associates for, for what she did as a third year lawyer in the cause of justice. Sir? The Supreme Court is a court of last resort. Yes. Well, you know, after I retired, I went for a hike 
with some old friends of mine, one of whom is the development officer for a charity. And he'd been, buy, he'd been trying to buy me a cup of coffee for 10 years because I love his organization, he knows. Uh, and he'd take me out for a cup of coffee and I would always buy my own coffee. And he said to me, after I retired, I was on a hike with him and, and this guy neither of us knew. Uh, and he said, Paul, now next time we go out, can I buy you the coffee now that you're retired? And I said, yes, you can. And so the third guy was with us, said, what's that about? And he, we told the story about my being a judge until recently. Uh, and my friend said, see, Paul had too much integrity to even, even let me buy him a cup of coffee. Of course, he said, but I never tempted him with a nice vacation in Jackson <laughs> Hole or whatever. I don't know if Paul had that much integrity. <laughs> I like to think that I would. But to go back to the serious question you raise, it's, you know, if you're going to be governed by the rule of law, you need independent courts. And that's why it's hard for anybody to do anything to anyone on the highest court, uh, short of impeaching him anyway, uh, who misbehaves, if you consider that misbehavior. And there's no code of ethics for the Supreme Court. I wasn't letting Gary buy me that cup of coffee because there is a code of ethics for every other judge in America. Uh, and I didn't feel comfortable under my code of ethics letting him buy me a cup of coffee. Uh, but the Supreme Court is the only court that doesn't have such a, 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 uh, uh, su such a code. And I would be worried if we asked Congress to step in and adopt one, for instance. Uh, I'm active in the American Bar Association. I was just appointed to the, uh, to the American Bar Association's uh, committee on judicial, uh, judicial ethics and professional responsibility. And that's the thing we're debating right now. What should we as an organization, the biggest organization of lawyers in America, recommend happen in that circumstance? And I don't think we should recommend that anybody impose something on the Supreme Court because if they can do that, it's not so great a leap for them to impose decisions on the U.S. Supreme Court. He hasn't broken the law. There's no evidence that I've heard, as far as I know, that, that the guy who's given him millions of dollars in freebies over the years has ever directly been in the Supreme Court, had interest in the Supreme Court. No, but the fact is you owe money on gifts. Oh, oh you're ta the tax laws. Well, oh, yeah. That may be right. And we can't do anything about it. Well, the the U.S. attorney could prosecute him for violating the tax laws. Um, I hadn't thought of that aspect of it, but sure, I mean, that's what's happening with Donald Trump right now. The U.S. attorney is saying, uh, if you violate a federal criminal law, I'm going to indict you. The U.S. attorney could do that in D.C. too, I suppose. Um, but uh, that or impeachment, I think, are the only answers. I don't think it's an answer to try to impose from outside, to let any other of the two bodies uh, of our government impose uh, anything on the Supreme Court that they themselves don't adopt for themselves. And maybe they will. John Roberts is very concerned about the image of the U.S. Supreme Court, and he should be these days. And I think with his leadership, maybe something will be adopted going forward only um, that would impose the sorts of limits that every other judge in America has. I don't know. I would hope that, but I don't want to do it from outside. Yes. Yes. Why don't we have one for the Supreme Court? <laughs> there is a current controversy. One of my friends, after I retired, sent me this and complained about it, sent me this article he'd found about a judge on the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a specialized court in Washington which handles just appeals in intellectual property cases, patent, copyright, stuff like that. She's 95 years old, and she's, her colleagues are trying to push her off the court but she's a federal judge. The federal judges have no age limits. Uh, and so, um, and, and she's not getting her work done, apparently. And by the way, I, th I read in this article, some of her colleagues are not sure that she's entirely mentally capable of doing the job at 95. And she's fighting back. You know, she's hired a lawyer to sue her chief judge about cutting her out of the, uh, not sending new assignments to her, for instance. So that's the, <laughs> the downside of the federal system is there is no age limit. They can't force you out absent really odd circumstances. And, and maybe this lady will be a test case. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah. 
There is that talk. Um, there's a commission studying the Supreme Court generally, appointed by, I think, the Democrats in Congress. Uh, and um, that's one of the issues they're considering. Uh, nine people is, uh, that's, that's bigger than most state Supreme Courts in this country. We have seven on our Supreme Judicial Court here. Uh, I don't know how it works in much of the world, but you're right, I think some of them are larger. The difficulty with that is, again, it's, FDR tried this, right? It thought about this. I think maybe enacted legislation, pardon me, introduced legislation in the 1930s out of dissatisfaction with the old conservatives on the court and how they were striking down some of his imaginative New Deal ways to keep America afloat during the Depression. Uh, he actually introduced legislation or came close to it uh, for, uh, on the same grounds that, you know, if these nine old guys don't get out of the way, we need to have 15 people and we can outvote the old conservatives. And that's the same theory now. That worries me as well for the same reason that you're interfering with the branch of the government that may be doing a bad job in some people's view right now of, of, prote of protecting the rights of uh, certain Americans. But, it, uh, but nonetheless, to mess with the institution as a result, you know, then you add three more people when the pendulum shifts the other way in 20 years. Uh, I, I think it's a dangerous way to go. Um, I think we have to, people who think that these people are not recognizing modern realities uh, need to uh, just wait for the pendulum to, on the Supreme Court to swing back. Yes? There are actually more than that. They each have a uh, there, there is a circuit justice is what they call him. So um, Steve Breyer was the circuit justice for the federal courts in, in New England because he was from New England, well, he, actually from somewhere else, but he'd spent his professional career uh, here in New England. Uh, so each, um, each of the circuits has one of the Supreme Court justices assigned as the sort of liaison, really. There are more, there are more districts than there are uh, I, It's actually done on a circuit level. There are... 11, 12, 12 or 13 circuit courts of appeal. Like the first circuit, as I said, covers most of New England plus Puerto Rico. So Breyer was, in, was, the, was the circuit justice for the first circuit. It's mostly ceremonial, although when the, uh, when the, panel, when the petition comes from the person on death row, who's about to be executed tomorrow, and he's lost all his other appeals, and he goes to the Supreme Court the night before he's going to be executed, it ends up in the hands of the circuit justice for Mississippi, Texas, wherever he's about to be executed, not Massachusetts, obviously. Uh, so that's the one, that's one substantive role those people have in regard to the circuit. The decision on the shadow docket, uh, You would, you, that would be called a shadow docket decision, which is essentially a decision where the court is deciding whether to do something temporarily and in a hurry or not. The shadow docket that people complain about most these days is where the Supreme Court gets an appeal and says, uh, we are going to hear the appeal. We're going to let you write briefs and come argue and we'll think about it. But until then, we are going to either stop the lower court decision or leave it in place. There was one recently from um, Alabama, was it, where they, over gerrymandering, where the a federal judge in Alabama had thrown out the, um, the map drawn by the legis Every black person in Alabama somehow fit into one congressional district, and so, uh, which, of course, is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, because they're not getting, a, and probably other provisions of the Constitution. Uh, and this Alabama federal district judge said that, he was affirmed by the Circuit Court of Appeals. And it was taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, which said, okay, we'll hear this case, but for the moment, until we hear it in full, we're going to leave that decision, we're going to stop those decisions, stay those decisions. So that one, that huge <laughs> black person congressional district was how the, the, the voting happened in the 2022 elections. And the gripe about the shadow docket is if you're going to do something like that, do it out in the open, do make a reasoned decision, tell us why you think it's important, Supreme Court, that that, that congressional uh, redistricting stay in that form when two levels of the court below you have just said it's unconstitutional. Why would you do that? And they do it sort of under cover of darkness. 
to their credit, the Supreme Court ultimately, recently, oh, sub, uh, affirmed the decision by the lower court judges, and they, the Supreme Court tossed it out, but not before they'd used the shadow docket accidentally or deliberately, who knows, to, uh, to, put the, uh, to, to keep that redistricting uh, scheme in place for the 2022 elections. And in the House of Representatives so narrowly divided, maybe that made a difference. And maybe they were thinking that, or maybe not. But we don't know. It's not very transparent. It's a shadow docket, right? But the way sometimes it happens, as I said, in the death penalty case, that's also a shadow docket thing. A judge is deciding yes or no. Yes, you can execute this man at dawn, or no, you can't. One judge, justice, decides that. And he says, and, we'll, and if the answer is no, you can't, well, we'll have a full appeal a year from now after people have written their briefs and stuff. But in the meanwhile, he stays alive. That's also an example of a shadow docket sort of decision. Yes. Just a comment about the Brown decision again. Yeah. It seems to me that's like the impetus of the civil rights movement. We had the decision that, that separate but equal was no longer a right. 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 Now you have Rosa Parks bringing up the, in the bus situation in 55. Yeah. And um, Little Rock in 1958. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think Brown was the seed that planted that. I think that's right. I, want, I just had the pleasure, and it was such a pleasure. Uh, for in my ABA work, American Bar Association work, um, I was asked to do, the ABA has something called a judge's journal. They publish it twice, every two months. And the first, in the front of it, is something called The Waymaker, an article about a judge who made way for those who would follow her. Uh, and I got asked to interview Jerry Hines, who was the first African-American female justice of our SJC, State Supreme Court. Um, they asked me because she'd helped train me as a Superior Court judge when I was new. She, uh, a year after I became a Superior Court judge and was her colleague and learned a lot from her, she was promoted at the age of 66 to the Appeals Court, and a year after that, at the age of 67, to the State Supreme Court. I'm sure the governor had in mind the symbolism <laughs> of putting a black woman on those two appellate courts, and she had certainly earned it as a Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, anyway, she's from Scott, Mississippi, and so I start the interview by saying, so how does a little black girl from Scott, Mississippi, end up on the state Supreme Court? And she told her story, of, she was born in 47, I think, of living through segregation in the South before Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and um, <laughs> and I, she ended, so she, she left home at 15 to go to college. She said, because my parents, you know, the Freedom Riders were coming through, and my parents wouldn't let me get involved. They were scared. And I wasn't, and I knew, you know, I knew because um, Emmett Till had just been murdered the summer before. We were all worried. We all knew people who, you know, moved north and sent the kid home to spend the summer with grandma. And we were worried that some of our friends were in that category. They might get killed like Emmett Till was. And so she told me the story of growing up in that culture, the beginning of the civil rights movement. And it was so scary and heartwarming at the same time. And she went to law school because she said, well, I applied to Ole Miss. They didn't let me in. I applied to Tulane. They didn't let me in. And then these four white kids from Wisconsin drive up to my college campus, and they say, we've convinced the dean of the University of Wisconsin that we should admit black students to our law school. Uh, and the dean said, I'm, I think you're right, but I don't know any. <laughs> So these four white law students get in a car and they drive south and they convince her to fill an application and they bring it back to Madison and she goes to the University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, one of four people in her class, two of whom actually survived through graduation. Um, and um, stories like that are just a tribute to America, I think. But what an interesting time that was. Boy. And the story she told me, by the way, about being a young black female defense attorney in the Superior Court in the early 1970s were kind of scary too. <laughs> in fact, she said the best thing that ever happened to, to make things fairer for black criminal defendants, and by the way, the black people who were occasionally defending, and there weren't a lot of them, a lot of them were white people defending in those days. She said the best thing that ever happened to make that situation fairer was that in 1970, early 70s, mid 70s, a state constitutional amendment was passed that imposed mandatory retirement on all Massachusetts judges. And she said, so all those old white guys had to retire all at once. And we got a new crop who were a little bit more up with the times and appreciated the civil rights movement and were nicer people to me as that young female black attorney, defense attorney. Uh, she says, best thing ever. <laughs>
Uh, although it meant she only served three years on the state Supreme Court before she had to retire. Um, but she's keeping busy, by the way. But. So next issue of the Judge's Journal. Read my article about her. It's coming out in June, I think. This month, I think. Maybe next month. Yeah. Well, we saw it in, in, in uh, January 6th. But, but this is, could be worse? Could be. It's just as illegal under the, sedition, under the um, insurrection laws. There are, there are laws that uh, 200 people have been prosecuted. 70 of 80 of them have gone to jail. And well, they should, by the way. For, I mean, pe people died there uh, for crying out loud. My daughter-in-law works in that building. Uh, and fortunately, she was working from home that day. Um, you know, that hit, uh, but even without the personal connection, you can't have people going armed to the U.S. Capitol with hang, putting a gallows on the front lawn of the U.S. Capitol and saying, hang the vice president of the United States. Yeah, that's illegal. <laughs> a lot of laws broken there. I was just thinking, like, well, you hear this threats about, you know, what's coming up in the future, you know, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, I've been heartened, I must say, by the lack of violence at Trump's two <laughs> arraignments at this point, right? <laughs> Miami last week and in New York before that. Uh, we, we all worried about it. The press played up the danger. Yeah. Maybe that's not healthy either for them to play up the danger, but, uh, but things were relatively calm in those cases, which is, gives me a little bit of... People from both sides, why jail? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> My uh, son's best friend was um, staying in their Washington apartment on January 6th. Uh, he was down there working on a visa. He's a journalist who goes to Africa and he needed a visa. So he's staying with my son and he goes out walking on January 6th. And he, um, and he hears the, the crowd at uh, Lafayette Park or wherever it was uh, at the rally. And he's thinking, this is really odd. And then, he, so he walks somewhere else. And, and then um, some guy comes up to him, this older guy comes up and says, where's the place we're supposed to go? And, and my son's friend says, the place we're supposed to go? Yeah, you know, the, the president wants us to go to that place, you know, and, 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 you know, and take over. And Jake's thinking, hmm, that place. Oh, I think I know where that place, oh, you must mean the capital. And the guy says, yeah, yeah, that's the name of it. Where, where's the capital? And Jake points him to Georgetown and said, it's about three miles that way. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, uh, he, in that way, he protected my daughter-in-law and all of her colleagues who were at work that day, right? And the Vice President of the United States. <laughs> all right, so I've been up here for an hour. I'm happy to answer any other questions you've got or let you have more of, uh, of, the, good, of the goodies here. Yes? I finally was able to sit on the, in the jury. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because I work the emergency ward, I'm a registered nurse. Uh -huh. They don't want you, but don't feel badly. I said, really? Yeah. Well, in the jury selection process, there's all sorts of reasons to challenge people for cause. Um, if they know somebody in the case, right. if they have firm opinions that, you know, no gun crime should be crimes because we got a right to carry guns, there are all sorts of reasons you can get challenged for cause or for hardship. Mm -hmm. If economically, you, you know, you're a hairdresser, you're a, a, a contractor. Uh, and you're your own boss. You can, so the judge makes a decision about those people, and the lawyers can suggest this person shouldn't be on the jury because of her views on this or her professional experience with that. But the, the lawyers also get a chance to challenge, to excuse a certain number of jurors for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and so sometimes, and, and you know, it's hard. You, you know the biographical stuff about them? They will have answered some questions in a group about do you know anybody in the case? Uh, you, they may probably have answered a few questions a judge asked in follow-up. In a rape case, have you or anyone close to you ever been the victim of a sex crime? Stuff like that. Um, and, but, so, but that's all the lawyers know, not very much. And so we have, when I was a lawyer, I had this vision of the perfect juror in my head, and maybe she wasn't an emergency room nurse. I think that he did the right thing. <laughs> okay, well. So the case was, yeah. uh, it had jumped the curb and hit a lady with her child. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. I, I 
and those kinds I of cases. So that I, was sitting there <laughs> <laughs> I was once picking a jury when I was a lawyer, and there was a guy, the next guy up, was a, he worked for the IRS in Andover. This is in federal court. And he, and he just looked a little weird. The way he answered the questions was a little weird. And, uh, but there was no obvious reason to disqualify him as a juror. Uh, and so I found myself looking at my opposing lawyer at the next table thinking, I wish you would excuse him. Use one of your challenges on him so I don't have to because I just don't like the, I don't, he just seems weird. I'm not sure I want him in the jury room. And, and I noticed the lawyer's looking at me with exactly the same look on his face. Are you going to get rid of him? Because if you don't, I'll have to. <laughs> I forget which of us challenged him. used one of our challenges on the guy, but we were clearly of the same mind on him. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.